I was born Willie Alma Forrest. I was born to a 14-year-old girl who was married to a 21-year-old fella back during those days. I'm 92 years old. So back during those days, they would have put him in jail for, <laughs> you know, for marrying a 14-year-old girl. But anyway, they married, they were living with her grandmother, the 14-year-old girl, by the way, was named Johnny. But he had a sister who lived in Doretta, Louisiana, and he decided to go live with his sister to get a job, and he carried her. The grandmother wouldn't let him take the baby, Johnny, told Bertha, you can have the baby. And they went up there. He decided he didn't want to stay. But when Willie decided to leave as the father, Bertha wouldn't let them take the baby, so they left the baby with her. Bertha changed the baby's name to Lee Ethel Alma Forrest, and that's the name she kept the rest of the 92 years. They stayed in North Louisiana for a while. Then Bertha decided to leave so she came back to Baton Rouge, brought the baby to her mama, who was Frances Forrest, and her daddy. They lived on a farm, and she was a little girl between the ages of four years old and seven. And she liked living on the farm because you could get watermelon and burst them and eat them with your hand. But Bertha came and got me and carried me to Texas on a sawmill. We lived on a sawmill. She met a man and married him. So that meant he became my father. I was seven years old. They reared me from seven years old as mother and father to Leotha. I didn't even go to school until I was seven. But I knew how to read, I knew how to count, add, and all that because a cousin back on the farm had been teaching me all of that. We stayed on a sawmill, and this father got his eye put out in the mill where he worked. So we came back to Baton Rouge. Well, that time, he never could get a job worth anything with one eye. He couldn't work at the plant. Uh, you know, any of these places that would hire you. So here I am, a girl living in Baton Rouge. I was uh, nine years old when I got back to Baton Rouge, and I started public school, and I was a bad little girl. Yeah, it was survival of the fittest. You had to fight to survive. And my mother was worried about me, this adopted mother. And a neighbor said, put her in the lab school at Southern University. We had never heard of lab school, hadn't heard of Southern University. <laughs> the neighbor carried us up there, and I was enrolled in a lab school at Southern University in the sixth grade. So I spent elementary school, high school, and college at Southern University. My life changed because I was with a different um, category of, 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 of kids. I was with kids like the doctor's children, the preacher's children, the teacher's children, and all of that. And by this time, I wanted to be, you know, like them. I guess that was it. Believe it or not, I was a smart little girl for some reason, in spite of all of that. When I graduated from high school, they didn't have salutatorian or valedictorian at that time. They had the head of the class. That's what they call it. So I finished at the head of my class at high school and went on to college at Southern University. I liked to read, and when I went to college, I like foreign language, so I majored in French. 
I like sports. I played basketball, even though I was a little bit of something. I was good on the basketball team because I could get around, you know, and get the ball. <laughs> and uh, I liked music. Never could, wanted to play an instrument. I took piano for a while, but uh, I played just enough to satisfy myself. I'm not skilled in the piano. After I got grown, I bought myself a piano. And I played just to satisfy myself. I never played for other people. I go to church and hear the song at church and come home and play it. On the bus going to college every day, I'd pass a young man walking and I start meddling him out the window of the bus. And when I got to the campus, he came and said, who is that calling my name? His name was Joe Gray, and I wouldn't say anything. But the kids on the bus said, that she is right there. And he came to me and started talking to me. And that's how I met my first husband. But I told him my name was Sudame Josephus. I didn't tell him the right name. I turned my class ring around to make it look like a wedding ring. And I told him I was married, and I wouldn't let him come see me. But he, he knew the straight about me because the other kids knew me, and they told him. Because that's how he learned my name. Mm -hmm. they, they told him who I was and where I lived, because I never told him where I lived. He came one Sunday. My mother always gave dinner at 2 o'clock. And he came there, let's say, 10 minutes or two. And when he knocked on the door, I asked him in, and he had dinner. And I introduced him to my parents. Then after that, every Sunday he'd come, because I couldn't have company during the school nights or anything. We'd talk with each other on the campus at school. But we were not girlfriend, boyfriend, just friends and classmates. And and we called it my freshman year, the sophomore year. When he went home at the end of the sophomore year, he volunteered for the Air Corps. World War II was going on. When he came back for the beginning of the junior year, he asked me to marry him. And we married. We didn't tell my mom or anything. His brother sent him some money to buy some shirts, and he bought license for us to get married. And we went to a minister that I didn't even know because my grandfather was a minister and he wouldn't have married me. And all the ministers who knew my grandfather wouldn't have married me without my parents' consent. So we went to a minister we didn't know and who didn't know us, and he married us. And we got married the first of our junior year. So here he had a wife, and I had a husband. He was living in a dormitory on the campus. I'm still living with my mother, and we still coding. The other thing happened, I got pregnant. And people start, you know, shoo-shooing about us. And I said, we better give my parents the license because the people are talking about my being pregnant. So on an Easter Sunday night, we came from church and we gave my parents the license. And my poor mother cried all night long because she did not want me married, but she didn't know I was pregnant. We still didn't tell her that. We just, look, we married. And we must have gone on about three or four more months, and I'm developing, and I had to tell her. At the end of the school year, we had a, re a wedding reception and announced the marriage, and he moved in with us, and of course, went in the service, and I started following him to camps, you know, and like that, 
because we lived in California. He was in camp in California one time, and I went to California and lived with him. And, um, and I had left the baby at home with my mom. I stayed only eight months in California. I wanted to stay forever. I loved California, but my husband didn't want to stay in California. Yeah. What did my first husband do? Mm -hmm. He was a shop teacher in Port Allen, and he was a carpenter. He built about six houses in this subdivision, along with teaching school. Made no money, though, because he loved to do that type of work and pass you by and say, look, that's the house I built. <laughs> he would under, Rena said made no money, he would underbid a lot of time and would put things in there that wasn't really required to please the people because he delighted in doing that kind of work. I was in a black neighborhood, you know, and I didn't come in contact much with white only in the department stores or the grocery store or whatnot, and I had no problem. Let me tell you what else. When I lived in California, my best friend was white, and I went to her house every day. She had a baby and I had a baby, and we'd put the two babies in a playpen and let them play. I didn't think of her as being white, and I don't think she thought of me as being black. We were just friends. That's the kind of thing. And even my school teachers, like when they integrated the schools and they sent the little young white teachers to us, I was a friend to to those white teachers, you know, and whatnot. I was a counselor, and so when they had a problem in the classroom, they would come to me. And like I told you, this organization that I'm friends with, we we would meet once a month, and we meet and we hug it and we kiss it. If one if somebody and their family died or something. I went to the funeral in mine. They were at Joe Elther's funeral. I don't know. I have, this is what I feel. Whites like you as one. They go to bat for you. They do anything for you as one. They, you working for them and your boy get put in jail they going to get that boy out. My mom, I told you, worked for this white. And when her children, would, they got grown and moved away. Well, I'm grown too. But whenever they come to Baton Rouge, they come to see me. I had one incident. My husband came back from the service, and we went at his home up in Bastrop. And he's going to buy some pants because, you know, in the service, I gave away all his clothes and he had to buy pants. And we were in the, in the store, and uh, he's trying on the pants. And when he came out, they were going to fix the hem. You know, is this where you want the hem in your pants? And my husband said, yes. And the clerk said to him, what? He said, yes, and uh, the clerk said to my husband, how long does it take you to say yes, sir? And my husband <laughs> kicked the pants off in the store. When I first married, let me see how long it was before I went to work. Yeah, I worked after, uh, after I married. Uh, of course, my baby was four years old when I went to work. So that meant I was married four years before I went to work. I did 14 years at McKinley High School. I did 20 years at Scotlandville Senior High School, part of them as a teacher and part as a counselor. I did two years and retired from Baton Rouge Magnet High School as a counselor. 
if you want to know the greatest thing in my life, in, in, in that area was. From Skylandville, I carried 30 kids to New York one Easter holiday. My principal's son, who was a teacher at another school, went as the male chaperone. The bus driver served as a male chaperone with me. Now, those two young men, they were old enough to demand respect from those boys, but young enough to relate with them on the trip. Kids had never been out of Scotlandville. They had never been to the shopping center in downtown or anything. And I carried them and we went all the way to New York. When they integrated the school, they brought in young black, uh, white teachers in our school and they would run into it with the students and then they'd come to me, you know. For example, <laughs> one teacher told the students she's gonna send them back to Africa and they started storing crayon and erasers at her and all of that. And she ran out crying and came to me. She didn't go to the principal. I figured that she was young and, and didn't know any better. And I told her, I said, well, you know what? If I know anything about the word back, it means that you have been. I said, and the kids in your classroom have not been to Africa. So you shouldn't have told him that. I said, now you go back in that classroom. And she went back and she had no more trouble with him. I mean, it was little things like that, but we had uh, really four children at all because I lost the very first one. And then I had three that I reared to be grown. When he had a sudden heart attack, and died. And when he died, I stayed single 18 years. Not even cold in or anything. <laughs> and I guess the reason for that was I'm having grandchildren in between that and some old. And I'm helping parents my mom went blind and I'm taking care of her. My dad had a stroke and I'm taking, help to take care of him. My son finished from Harvard University in law and LSU was hiring him because they wanted a black on their law faculty. And he was wearing a bush. And when he went down there, they told him he had to cut the afro. They wouldn't hire him like that. And he, he had uh, two children. And he said, I'm not gonna cut my afro. And walked out. And he came, he was living with me at the time. He and his family, I said, man, you got a family. <laughs> you better cut that afro and take that job because I can't take care of you. I'm not going to cut it. And he he did. He cut it. One of the one of the instructors told him and my son taught law at LSU's law school for 2 years, but he grew his afro back. After the 18 years all the children all grown and grandchildren all gone and doing their thing. I met another guy who had been my boyfriend when I was ninth grade. <laughs> he had been away all those years and he came back to Baton Rouge and was my church member. And we started dating. We dated eight years. Can you believe that? I mean, like dating, like a boy and a girl. He come into my house every day for eight years, 
and not saying a word about marrying me. And then finally one day he came and said, let's get married. And I almost passed out. I said, what? Let's get married. Okay. I run to the telephone. I call my three children who are living. I'm finna get married. But after that, he came and he wouldn't say a word about marriage. And one day I said, do you still want to get married? I don't think I do. Okay, I don't have to. Look, I'm in my 60s now. Children all grown. I'm taking care of myself. I don't need a husband. <laughs>